Well, welcome in the precious and glorious name of Jesus to the wake-up call. My name is Robert Pears, and I'm so glad you're joining for a very powerful and urgent message that the Lord put in my spirit regarding the sign of Jonah, regarding this solar eclipse that is coming on April 8th, and what is happening on the earth. We need to really understand what's going on. Not that God wants us to walk in fear, but rather that we be prepared and that we would have a confidence as we recognize that God is the one who declares the end from the beginning. And He is the one who sits on His throne and He laughs because He will always have His perfect will done. So as He shows us how He is orchestrating, how He is fully in control, despite everything, oh, the enemy wants to so persuade people and he wants to so discourage believers to say, I have it, I am in control. It's all over. You feel like because of all the censorship, the resistance, and the persecution, that it's too difficult to preach this gospel. But you and I are anointed for such a time as this. And we need to get an understanding. There's a fresh oil anointing that God wants to pour out upon His church, upon those who will arise and shine and dare preach this gospel with such a confidence, knowing that He has full authority. We are to go forth and preach the gospel, working together with Him, and in there lies the key, while He confirms His word with signs and wonders following. God is not done yet, and I believe that it's all about a harvest. The Father is looking for a harvest of souls for Jesus, and we've been appointed for this time. So let's pray, let's press in, and get ready to receive a message that I know will bless and encourage you, and I pray, provoke you. Father, we come in the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus, and the authority of that name. And we thank you, Father, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart. Mighty Holy Spirit, pour in us, fill us. And Father God, I thank you for a fresh anointing for this hour. Father, give us clarity, give us a greater understanding, and let us know that every door that you open for us, that no man can shut. And every door that you shut, no man can open. You are Lord. And may we stand with an endurance, pressing forward, fulfilling the high purpose of heaven and seeing souls one for Jesus. And I thank you, Father, that not one person listening would walk away untouched or unchanged. But let them be blessed, Father, in that name that's above all names, the name of Jesus. We pray and everyone said, Amen. As long as the church is on this earth, we have a mission and a purpose, and it's never changed, and that is go and preach this gospel. He didn't say preach when the seasons are good. He said preach in season and out. Whether it's good or bad, we preach. We press forward. And I want to share with you, as I said, a message. And I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 12. I just want to mark something real quick. So Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is asked for a sign and he says this in verse 39. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now he explains for us Jonah was in the well for three days. But there's more to this sign, and I want you to see it. We understand that on April 8th there is an eclipse that's going to cross America. Now, these are very rare. We know what happened in 2017. But the last time prior to that, that an eclipse that just crossed America was 1776, a very significant year in U.S. history. And we see that things are accelerating. Uh, the birth pangs are gaining intensity and frequency as we get closer to the Lord's return. And it's easy to be persuaded by the narrative of the hour 
that it's just time for judgment, we are supposed to quit. But we are here and appointed for such a time as this. And we are to be found occupying, pressing forward, holding fast, being salt and light in a voice of righteousness for as long as we are on this earth. It's a time for us to gain a fresh uh, intensity and a fresh passion as we see how close it is to his return. We uh, cannot allow this generation to be simply lost. There are souls, and I understand we look and we see a hardened generation, but we've got to understand the power of his mercy to break and change things and to change the lives of people. And that's what this message is about. So he then, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, I had a great Jewish friend, he was a professor of theology, and I remember asking him to really teach me a lot because he was sharing with me how Jewish thought is so different, and you start to understand how God thinks uh, and how you know the Jews think very differently. And I was asking him regarding the signs of the times, and he pointed me to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Now we know there's already light, God has already created light. But it says this, Then God said, Let there be lights in the ferment of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and for years. Let them be for signs. And we have to underline that God, you know, we look up and we can see all the stars and how they follow circuits, and yet He orchestrated it knowing so perfectly that they tell a story and they can be used so wonderfully by him to bring us warnings. God will use the moon uh, to give warnings to the nation of Israel. So we see a blood red moon is a warning to the nation of Israel. But when he speaks to the nations, he uses the stars and the sun. So the coming uh, eclipse is a warning and a message to the nations. I look at... um, If we go back, we understand that there was an eclipse in 2017, and it crossed America. And prior to, said the one that before that was 1776. So 2017, it crosses and it goes through seven cities called Salem, which means peace. Then on April 8th, next couple weeks time, it's going to go through again, and it's going to go through seven cities called Nineveh. And those cities are found in Texas, Indiana, Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, and Nova Scotia. Uh, So what is God saying? Why would he pick Nineveh? And why is it tied to the sign of Jonah? Well, stay with me because there's a powerful message in this. If you go to 2 Kings, what we discover in chapter 18 is that there's this king from Assyria who begins to threaten um, the the kingdom of Judah under Hezekiah. And in chapter 18, we see this king, uh, Sennacherib, and he is a very successful. He comes down through Nineveh, and he comes down through what would be modern-day Syria, and through Lebanon, down through Israel, all the way into Egypt. And every city that he faces, he captures and destroys. Uh, So here we see that he begins to warm and threaten Hezekiah. And if I look at chapter 18, we see that, let me just get to the right verse, verse 14, that Hezekiah of Judah sent to the king of Syria uh, at Lachish. Now please underline that, I'm going to come back to that, saying, I have done wrong, turn away from me, whatever you pose on me, I will pay. And then the king of Assyria assessed Hezekiah, the king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. And at that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars of Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. This was an exuberant penalty. And we can see that what's going on right now uh, in America. What happens here is this king goes and he's going to the cities of Judah. Now, if you can imagine Judah, 
that the key city in Judah, the primary city, is Jerusalem. Lachish is the second city, and Lachish means invincible. Lachish is located on the southwest portion of Judah. And that's very important again. So he's coming and he's attacking Lachish. Uh, now, looking at this king, he makes a demand of Hezekiah, who's walking in fear, and seeks somehow to play politics, to try to come to some compromise. And what happens, instead of that which belongs and is holy to the Lord, he gives it to this king. And he lost sight of holiness. He's not looking to the Lord, but is trying to lean on his own strength. And this is what's going on right now. And it's even going on in the church. We've lost sight of who the Lord our God is. But what happens is that the king of Assyria doesn't stop. And he begins to boast. And we continue in the chapter. Um, he sends a messenger. And the messenger says in verse 29, Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you. Who deceive you? And we see right now this false narrative of what's evil has been declared good and what's good has been declared evil. And the soul controlling and the playing of a narrative that is there to cause you to feel full of fear, to manipulate, to control. And it will say you're being deceived when in reality, as a believer, you're trying to walk in the truth. And it goes on. Do not trust, sorry, do not, for he shall not be able to deliver you from his hand. Know that Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall be given into the hand of the king of Syria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus is the king of Assyria. Make peace with me by a present and come out to me. And every one of you eat from his own vine, and every one from his own fig tree, and every one drink of the waters of your own cistern until I come and take you away to a land uh, like, you own, uh, like your own land, of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive groves. So he begins to lie. He said, the, um, don't believe what Hezekiah is saying, because Hezekiah wants you to trust in the Lord. And he's saying, listen, but I'm going to take care of you, which was an absolute lie, because he was coming and destroying he was killing and they were raping and and we look at Lachish and it's very important that we get a hold of this town how they put up these ramparts to get up this hill and they stormed it uh, and when they took it they began to kill the people and they found a mass grave of 1500 people sounds very like what just happened on October 7th now if we go to Assyria we find this town called Nineveh. Now, it's very important that we get the whole story here because this king wants, of course, Jerusalem because that's the crown and glory. Lachish is great, but he's got to take Jerusalem. And he's now threatening them. He is making a whole lot of noise, and it's very fearful. And we have to look. He's surrounded. He's got Jerusalem. Um, just like Israel stands completely surrounded. And what we see happening to Israel is happening to the church. And it feels like, you know, the war is so intensified. There's a lot of fear in the air. There's a lot of discouragement. It's just, it's hard sometimes to get up these days. There's a lot going on. And you feel so surrounded, so discouraged. Because the spiritual warfare is so intense. And that constant bombardment of the enemy makes it so difficult. Lachish, that which said it's invincible. He's taken. He's declared, I'm greater than even that which was invincible. In your strength, I've defeated. So who are you to stand against me? So here's Hezekiah surrounded. And thank God for great men of God like um, Isaiah. Men that would bring him a word and tell them what God was about to do. And that they were to trust in the Lord. And that God would deliver that city. And God did. God sent an angel, one angel, during the night, and over 100,000, I think it was like 150,000 of the Assyrian army are killed. And as a consequence, the king flees. And he goes back to Nineveh. Nineveh was the biggest city in the time on the earth, massive city. And he has a great hall. 
And recently, oh, sorry, back in the 19th century, they began to do some digs. They thought they'd found the hall, so they began to you know, excav excavate it. And as they began to open it up, they saw these great gates. And they go through these gates, they found this room. And in the room, there were images, these plaques put on the wall, talking about this great battle, showing images and how this king um, stood there in judgment and decreed, you know, that they were going and, and that he was declaring judgment. And you see this battle, this place that they've won and taken over. And they were trying to wonder, where is this? What, what are these images of? They also found this stone with uh, engraving on it. And they were trying to translate it. Well, finally they see that there's a writing on the wall. And they ultimately are able to translate the writing. And the writing explains that is the king looking from this hill, looking at the city of Lachish. And they have these images of these ramparts, these, these things that they built, which funnily enough, in 1971, they did an excavation of Lachish. And they, you can go see the images of those ramparts, the things that they built were still there. They found the rocks still there. They found many of the weapons still there. And of course, the city that was destroyed. And so he's boasting of how he's defeated this city. All these images, all the terrible things that he did to the people because he was defeated. But what you don't find is why is he not boasting about taking Jerusalem? Why would you boast about taking the second greatest city and not the greatest? Why would you boast when you have a track record that every place and every city that stood up against you, you've defeated? And you go in against Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is unable to defend themselves, yet you have to flee. Why? So that you've got to get back. And we see, if you read is, um, 2 Kings 18 and 19, how he was a man filled with pride and thought he could win. And even when he was defeated, he refused to concede or give up. And he wants to boast of who he is. So he puts these things up and they were able to translate it and they were able to compare it to the Bible and find that they told the same story, different angles, same information, because the Bible explains that this king came in and took all the cities and took Lachish, which we just mentioned there. The king of Assyria said he took 46 cities, defeated them. But God defended Jerusalem. And I want you to understand that you may look around and see like it's, you're without hope. And the noise and the narrative is so great, it's thundering. The evidence is stacked up suggesting that he's right. But we have a God who carries absolute authority. So Jonah, the Lord tells him, go to Nineveh and go there and give them a warning. Now, the siege of um, the Kish was around 701. Uh, and I forget, it's like 70 or so years later that Jonah is sent to Nineveh. The king is gone. But he is the guy to go into this hallway, go into this chamber where all these images are that speak of this horrific event, of this king that came in and slaughtered Jonah's people and did horrendous things to them. And now you get to understand why Jonah did not want to go. He was not being foolish. He was not being difficult. But he could not understand how God could be merciful on a people that did that. He could not understand it. But he ultimately understood that he walked in a fear enough of God that God said, and ultimately he went. You know, to recognize, God, you were Lord. And there's things he says to us that we struggle with that are against everything we, we think is right. But he says it's true. And he sent Jonah to go to that very place and to preach to them. And when he comes in and preaches, guess what happens? There's a solar eclipse. And this is so important because remember, Jesus begins to tell them as Jonah was in the whale. Now, Nineveh means fish. I find that so interesting. Jonah has been in a fish, a whale, He's stinking of fish, and he comes to the city called Fish. Is God speaking to the church? Because their symbol was a fish, 
And of course, that's the symbol that we carry as Christians. And so I believe it's a warning to the church as well. So as he's preaching, there's a solar eclipse and everything goes dark. But the people repented and God had mercy on them for a season. Now, ultimately, there was a prophetic word given about their destruction. And if you go and you look at that area of Nineveh today, that's exactly what it looks like, like the prophet said. It's a wasteland. However, you will also find that in Nineveh, they still have a memorial to Jonah, whom they honor. Think about that. They still recall that Jonah came there, and Jonah preached there, and Jonah had an impact there. Now, coming forward, we see here that God wants to so get our attention and we are not always been told everything that's going on. Uh, I've talked before about the Gog Magog War. See, we're in a season, and I believe something changed on October 7th. There was a spirit, or spirits loosed on this earth of just terror. Hamas in Hebrew means um, violence, terror, and we see that throughout. And we see how it spreads to the nations in this rise in anti Semitism. And we're also seeing a rise in an anti-Christian message. I look at what's going on in America, and I see what's coming uh, politically, and this hatred that's going on, and it's being pointed and directed at Christians. And the pressure that's being applied to Christians will continue to grow, just as it's growing towards the children of Israel, the Jews. And that pressure that wants them to back down and it's, it's, it's just absurd. You look at it, and there's no sense of true justice. There's no sense of, you know, looking at things correctly. But there's a voice on the earth of lawlessness. There's a voice of deception on the earth. And we must, in this hour, more than ever, as we look at what's going on, get a hold of it in light of the Word. Let the Word interpret. Do not allow that what you hear to interpret the word or to interpret the Lord. This will cause so many people to stumble and fall because they're in this hour. They're not interested in telling you the truth. I don't care what channel you're listening to. I don't care what news source. They have a narrative. And we could talk about the elites and we could talk about the forces behind the scenes. We could talk about the great tech giants. And we could talk about all those things and how they control everything. Um, you know, I don't know whether this is the way it's going to work out, but I look at when the Antichrist rises. We know that he's of this system of ten toes, and it says there are ten kings that have not yet received a kingdom. And I watched a great video that was explaining how they give capability for the Antichrist to reign. And in this hour, um, who gives the greatest capability? It's not military power necessarily, but we could look at these great tech giants and the real power that they possess and the impact that they could have. We will see. We see what's going on, on the earth and how they can truly can influence and change things. Uh, and we see that in days past, you know, the news was meant to be a force that stirred things challenged the narrative and sought to hold people accountable and produce truth. Today, it's a tool to be used by elites to produce their uh, agenda and to declare their narrative. It's not about truth. It amazes me sometimes, and I like to, I very much avoid looking at the news, but when I read an article, I want to research it. And I'll take and I hear such and such said this, well, let's go listen and listen to it in context. And I'm like, that's not what that person, he or she said. That's not the context. That's not what really happens. But see, that's not what's important in this hour. It's all about a narrative. And if you are listening to that and they'll say facts, they don't mean facts. They mean their opinions. You must come to the word. And we need the Holy Spirit right now, who's the spirit of truth. He will tell us the things that are to come to guide us, because we need wisdom. You need, in this hour, to honestly develop your secret place relationship with the Lord, to draw nigh unto Him, to draw closer to Him than you've ever been. It's time to stop playing games. It's time to stop, 
you know, occasionally turning up to church, occasionally praying, occasionally reading the Word. It's the time where we've got to go after the Lord and seek His face. When's the last time you stayed up seeking the Lord alone, that God, I've got to connect with you? When you're a time when nobody was there, that God, I've got to touch you, I've got to reach you, no matter how long it takes. Sometimes we put on worship music to distract us. And when we get caught up in it, it is simply a distraction. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about truly pursuing Him. Whether there's worship music going on or not, God, I'm after you. And like Jacob, I'm not leaving until I don't walk the same and you bless me. Until I leave changed and transformed and all that complacency is shaken off me. And I stand ready because we don't have anything to give in this hour except what we receive from Him. There's a group right now that are preaching a head nudge of this word and they're producing persecution. They're going to create and and really exasperate the persecution coming in Christians because they're not bringing the substance of life. We can do things that look good, sound good, but they don't have the touch of the master. They don't care the wisdom, the unction. They don't care the guidance of the Lord our God, so that what we do declares accurately His purpose in this hour, so that we're preaching effectively a message that touches and changes lives. That comes by abiding in the secret place. We need to be so radically changed that the world sees each one of us as living epistles touched and changed by the very hand of God. It's time to stop playing games. Now, I said there's more going on, and there is. We live in an hour where we think we are invincible. We think we have it all. And we're trying to compromise like Hezekiah. Walk in the middle of the road. Is there a way? And Hezekiah, I'm guilty. Put himself under. You don't put yourself under the world. We put ourselves under the Lord our God. We walk with a revelation that he carries authority. This is an hour for us to abide in the word and trust his word like never before. We're called to that. If we look at the warning to the message, sorry, the warning to the church of Philadelphia, hold fast my word. And that's the message of this hour. Hold fast my word. Um, and as I said, I've talked a little about this war, Gog and Magog. This invasion that's coming to Israel. In previous wars, and of course we could talk about 1948, we could talk about the 67, you know, and other wars that have occurred in Israel, and how they've been local. Um, but this is bigger. And what's going on right now in the Middle East is a tinderbox that could ignite into a third world war so easily. And there are people playing with fire. And the nations which at one time were supporting Israel initially are now turning on Israel. And Israel is about to stand alone. And that, I believe, is when the giant is about to attack. The alliance between Russia and Iran has grown. And instead of the West standing up, they're appeasing. They're giving the golds and the billions, hoping it will solve the problem. But they're not recognizing the real danger and what's going to happen. We see that that war that started in Gaza is spreading. And we see, of course, the Houthis, who now claim that they have a hypersonic missile. We'll see if they do. Um threatening one of the major shipping routes in the world. There's a lot happening. There's a change going on in Africa. As more and more nations that once were in alliance with America and the West are now connected with, in a league with, um, Russia and Iran. The world is changing and changing fast. And we have to understand that things, particularly uh, as we look at America and the election coming up, and I'm not going to get to politics here, but I'm going to say this, that many people seeing the potential for change in government realize that the window to do something is short, and it could spark things and cause things to happen in the next few months, and we'll have to watch. That's why we got to pray. I believe that time is very, very short. Now remember, Jesus warned there was a generation that would see all things, from the birth of Israel onwards. And that generation is getting old. Time is running out. And we've got to recognize we're in borrowed time. And that window 
is closing fast. The world as we know it is changing. The, the visions that, you know, years ago of growing up and, you know, retiring and the life that we once live is changing. It's all gone. The world is becoming a place that I don't know about you, I don't really want to be there anymore. I don't like what I see on the horizon. And I'm so grateful that God's got a greater plan. While we look at what's going on in the Middle East, we also are seeing right now that Russia is beginning to build up her troops, not just in Syria, but close to the Golan Heights or the Israeli border. Why? And we have to understand that Iran has been shipping weapons into Syria to get into the hands of the various proxies that are attacking Israel. And we look at the Gog Magog war, we understand the critical role that Iran plays. Really, Iran's the real leader. Russia goes in as a, a force to protect. And it becomes opportunity. We see that what's happening in Ukraine and the tension of the nations. We see the real threats of nuclear war. I grew up in the 80s, I remember those days. But these are worse. The threats. There's a real threat behind it. There's a real potential. And I'm not saying it will. But I look at, and I shared in the video on Gog Magog, I don't see America or Russia in the end times. And I have to wonder what happens. And I don't fully know. But as I look, I see that the stage is being set for that war that is coming. And God warned and said that in that day, in that day, so there's a time period, there's something going to happen a day. There's coming on this earth a particular day that will be defined that at some point we'll be able to look back in history and say something happened, that there was this day and it became the opportunity for Russia to suddenly attack. There's something specific. There's a day coming. Now that may be a term and it can mean a week, a year, a day, but it's referring to a specific time period. And we see that this day is coming. And clearly right now, the alliances are being formed like never before of the nations. And this is different because in previous wars that Israel faced, they were local, like the Psalm 83, all around. But right now, there are nations that are threatening and trying to attack that are distant including Iran, including Yemen, and of course, Turkey is now rising up as well. We know that those close nations like Lebanon uh, are, are attacking, and it really could at any moment explode. I don't know how that Russian invasion will start, but I know that it is on the horizon, and we've got to recognize the time and understand that it's, point, it's critical that we rise up and preach this gospel. It's not a time to compromise. It's a time to trust. If God could keep the children of Israel, and we have a testimony that archaeology confirms that in the most impossible situation where Israel should have been defeated, Jerusalem should have been destroyed and taken, that God would not allow it. Because when God is for you, who can be against you? God can do the most incredible things, and I don't know how long we've got. I know that God can put in a, a stop. God could put in a great revival. God can do a lot of things. There are no scriptures that I can use to completely defend and say that there will be another great revival. There are scriptures I use to say I pray and hope that there will be. There are things that I know. I know He's coming soon. I know there's coming that tribulation period, and I know that as we see that time period, it is getting worse and worse on the earth. And we can talk about and show that scripturally. I also see that in the body of Christ, so many ministries backsliding, preaching a different message in this critical hour. Instead of preparing people, what they're doing is confusing. Oh, it's all going to get better. It's all going to be good. Yet that is not in the scripture. I may not fully understand, but God in His perfect plan and His perfect understanding has said that this is the way it will be, has declared there's coming a tribulation period will be the darkest, worst time in human history. But in the midst of that, 
there'll be the greatest harvest. I don't understand it all, but he said it and he will surely do it. We are in a time period leading up. How long do we have? I do not know. But I do know this. We have to recognize that we're in the final hours of the last days. And whether that means we have days, weeks, months, maybe years, I don't know. But we need to live with a great sense of imminency and preach this gospel with a great passion that can only come by abiding in the secret place of His presence. You cannot afford to go a day without it. You must live ready. I pray that I so stir you that like never before you get in and know the secret place of His presence and have a holy intimacy. Be filled with the holy fear of Him and give Him what is due Him and don't take those things that belong to Him and use them to compromise, to take the truths of the Word and compromise to appease an adulterous generation. We have to stand up, and I understand it comes at great cost and pain, but if we don't stand up in love, and I underline that word love, because as I finish, I want to go to Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, we are warned as we see that day approaching. In chapter 10 of Hebrews, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more, the more you see the day approaching. Let us consider one another. We need to be praying for each other like never before. And I want to so encourage you, would you consider joining us, standing with us, whether officially or unofficially. I am praying and believing God for big things this year to press forward like never before, to see more backsliders than ever before one back, to reach more people, to see more people fulfilling their high call, to run the race set before them, to give all that I can, so that they're equipped and strong. And I need people standing with me, praying with me, whether that's officially or not. If you're official, I just ask that you, would you sign up? You do get our email newsletter uh, once a month, at least once a month. We are holding on our Tuesday Zoom services a time where we're praying and particularly going after people that need healing. So you can join us. You get the information uh, in the email. And of course, as you stand with us, and you pray and you agree to pray. I believe there's an impact. Paul asked for his partners to pray for him for an open door. So please stand for an open door so that we preach this gospel effectively, accurately, and see people one. And we share in the reward together. Whether you do it officially or not, uh, officially, as I said, simply go to robertpares.org, go to the partner page, and you can sign up and you will get our email newsletter. And if the Lord puts in your heart, would you be a financial partner? It's really on my heart. We want to press forward. God's put in me a, a heart for a revival center, a center here that we can put up a church and we can put a place where we can train people, help people, a place where we can have a museum to show, you know, really information on the heroes of the faith of the past and the revivals to really help provoke people. Together we can do this. And I just want to thank you. I don't know how much time we've got, but let us run and, and do the two minute warning with a greater intensity with a greater fervor and with a greater accuracy a more effective just to zone in jesus as he approached jerusalem said he said his face is flint we've got to set our face as flint in this final stretch and not be distracted but stand together in love if you do not have a church and i want to finish with this you need one and if you're looking for one you consider joining our online services so you get a now word or right word while you're looking for more information, simply go to robertpairs.org and go to the About page and you can sign up. I just want to so and bless you, encourage you, and tell you to keep your eyes looking up for our Redeemer draweth nice. We are in exciting times. We're at a time that so many in the past longed to look for and see and be a part of.
but we are chosen. And you and I are anointed and appointed for such a time as this. Amen. So I thank you and I bless you in the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. And I remind you as always that this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because through and for him in that name that is above all names, the name of Jesus we pray and everyone said, Amen and Amen. Thank you.